Hi, this is Dan Bullard, retired electronics engineer, sitting on the front deck of my houseboat again. It's a lovely day. We're getting close to Halloween. The boo boat probably won't come by, but it did come by yesterday. It's pretty cool. I love the boo boat. I want to talk about voltage regulators. You know, it's crazy. It's super simple in my mind. You know, that was uh, for the STS 3000 training course. That was the first device that they tested, and it was a 78L05, but I'm going to show you a 7805 because there was a military project I worked on. I shouldn't talk about who did it, but um, um, th they had a voltage regulator in there, and I was asked to develop a test program for the voltage regulator, and I did, and I pursued this technique, and I'll show you what it is. It's pretty cool. Here we have a picture of a 7805, LM7805. On the input pin, I have to use a VI, and I've talked about VIs before. A VI can force voltage or force current, and it can measure voltage or measure current. And you can program clamps so you, so you don't exceed any particular value. So here I have my 7805. Uh, I have a VI on the input, I have a VI on the output in force current mode, and a VI on the ground pin. Yes, you have to put a VI on the ground pin. You could just connect it to ground, but then you'll never know how much current's flowing out of the ground pin, and we kind of need to know that. That's one of the specs in the spec sheet, if you look at a spec sheet for the 7805. Okay, so in this case, um, if I'm just going to do a standard... 7805, um, we have to have VI that could go between 7.5 volts to 30 volts because the maximum input voltage is 30 volts. The normal lowest voltage is 7.5 volts. So on the input, we're going to program anywhere from 7.5 volts to 30 volts and then test the output. So, you know, we can test regulation capability by measuring the output voltage uh, with it at 30 volts, measure the output voltage with it at 7.5 volts, and see what the difference is. And that's one way to do it. That's voltage regulation test. One of the problems here is this VI needs to be fairly high power because the VI has to provide up to 1.5 amps because we're going to force current on the output and the maximum current is supposed to be 1.5 amps. So we may provide up to 30 volts at up to 1.5 amps. That's 45 watts. So that VI has to be pretty beefy. Now, different testers have different specs on their VIs. And so, you know, it's, you just don't know. You know, it depends on what you're trying to do. So if I have a tester that doesn't have a lot of high powered VIs, I'm going to be limited on how many of these devices I can test in one shot. That's called multi-site testing. And so the, the handle will put four or eight or 16 devices in a socket, and then the tester will test them. And, you know, if you don't have, if you can't get enough high power VIs, you can't test eight or 16 or 32 of these voltage regulators. They're only three pin parts, you know. So, um, that's a problem. You have to keep that in mind because every tester has different specs and they design their testers around what their customers might be doing with them. Okay, so that's a 45 watt VI. It's got to be 45 watts minimum. Okay, um, the ground pin, let me just talk about that real quick. I'm going to force it to zero volts and it doesn't take much current on the ground pin. It's like 5 milliamps maximum, and they do have a spec for that, so that may be one test you do. You're going to measure current on the ground pin and measure no more than, hopefully, no more than 5 milliamps. Okay, on the output pin, we have a VI that's going to be in force current mode. This is the first time we've seen a VI in force current mode. We're going to force anywhere from 0 milliamps to 1.5 amps, and that can be tricky, you know, if you're telling it force current in zero milliamps. These things like the auto range, 
And so if you force it to produce zero milliamps and you change your mind to do the next test and say, oh, by the way, now I need 1.5 amps, it may want to do a range change. And that's bad. That's generally not a good thing because that means you're flipping relays in a current path and that's not good. That's never good because it can cause all kinds of problems. So um, normally I would just say force zero milliamps in the two amp range if it has a two amp range. And so force zero milliamps in the two amp range and then force 1.5 amps in the two amp range and no relays get switched. That's important to know. You know, you don't normally want to hot switch relays. You don't want them switching while current's flowing. And you don't want to interrupt the test just to power everything down and switch the relays and power everything back up. Okay, so this is going to be up to 5 volts, up to 1.5 amps. That's 7.5 watts maximum. So between the two, we have uh, 45 watts maximum and 7.5 watts maximum, and then the VI and the ground pins, virtually nothing. Um, so when we do this, we're going to do things like we'll put in 7.5 volts with that VI on the input, we'll force zero milliamps on the output in the two amp range and then measure the voltage and then draw more current say 1.5 amps and measure the voltage again and see if it changes much and that's kind of a standard thing for voltage regulators it's a very simple part but it takes a lot of brains to think about how you can test it Okay, um, we'll take it up to 30 volts and we'll have zero milliamps on the output and then we'll um, take it up to 1.5 amps and look at the output and see how much that changed. So um, those are standard tests, standard kind of things. Okay, now the device that I was going to test was more than this. It was a lot more than this. It, it would take like a couple hundred watts and I didn't really, I didn't want to go out and buy new, new power supplies and new VIs. So I came up in an alternative way. And this is pretty cool. I did the same thing on the input. VI in fourth voltage mode, 7.5 volts to 30 volts. But I didn't use a high power VI. I used a low power VI. I'm not going to draw 45 watts out of this thing. The ground pin's the same, but the output is now not connected to ground. The output is connected to the input. It's in a current force mode, forcing current in a loop through the device. So I'm going to force 30 volts or down to 7.5 volts but the current on the output is going to be forced between the output and the input. So the current's not going to go to ground. When the input is at 30 volts, when VN is at 30 volts, the output will be at 5 volts because it's a 5 volt regulator. And so that means I may drop as much as 25 volts. So that VI may have to, pro have to provide up to 25 volts. And it might have to provide up to 1.5 amps. And so that could be 37.5 watts maximum. But notice that it's not what we had before with the 45 watts on the input. The input VI is only forcing the current that flows out of the ground pin. The ground pin is zero volts and it takes a maximum of about five milliamps. So I don't really need much on there, only 0.15 watts. So a one watt VI would do the trick, you know. On the output, uh, if the input's at 30 volts, the output will be at 25 volts between the input and the output. The output's always five volts, but 25 volts difference between the input and the output. And that would be, if I had 1.5 amps flowing, that would be 37.5 watts. Notice that this is lower power than the other solution has 
a lot more power. Not a lot more, but, you know. So I'm using a very low power VI on the input, a very low power VI on the ground pin, and a fairly high power VI on the, on the output pin. So this is pretty cool because uh, when I'm testing this 5 volt regulator, I'll put in 30 volts with the output drawing 0 milliamps to, to VI so I can measure voltage or measure current. So I'll measure voltage, make sure it's 5 volts relative to ground. It'll measure that. And then I'll have it force 1.5 amps and make sure that it's still 5 volts. Right? That's voltage regulation. That's what it's doing. And when I put in 7.5 volts, I'll get out 5 volts and it'll be much lower power because I've only got a 2.5 volt drop across the device. So it's relatively low. So the output power is very low. The output power at maximum is with a 30 volt in, 5 volts out, 1.5 amps in, 1.5 amps out, but the output 1.5 amps is not coming from that VI on the input, it's coming from that VI that's in current force mode. So it's very cool. Now, the neat thing about this was it only requires one fairly high power VI. Now this particular project had a number of pins that needed to be uh, measured and it even had more. The VI's sorry, the uh, voltage regulator required more than 37.5 watts. Now that could be a problem. You say, oh, that's a problem. No, it's not. Let's say we needed um, four and a half amps. What would you do here? If you needed four and a half amps, you just put two more VIs on there. Just add them in. And so those VIs can force one and a half amps each, now you're getting four and a half amps total. Remember Kirchhoff's law, currents can add, and so the currents will add, irregardless of what the voltage is doing. Hopefully you don't do anything stupid and program <laughs> with a voltage clamp in one, on one VI that's not compatible with the other VIs. But uh, you can actually do that. You can have multiple VIs forcing current so you can get to the current that you need. So if you need four and a half amps, you can just have three VIs stacked up there together and you're gonna force 1.5 amps and 1.5 amps and 1.5 amps and good old Kirchhoff says those currents will add and they will. Now, this would have worked great. There's one little problem. They were using HP VIs. And it's common on VIs to have a P gate function. P gate says power gate on or power gate off. And in power gate on, it does whatever you tell it to do, force voltage or force current, whatever. But these HP VIs had a P gate off that forced the output to zero volts. Oops. That's a problem because if you force it to zero volts, now suddenly you force one of them to zero volts. Wow, the others are forcing one and a half amps. Ooh, that's not good. So it really screws everything up. It totally screws everything up. And I anticipated this when I designed this. And so what I thought was, well, I'm good enough. I can write, I can rewrite the code for this VI. I'll just have to go to HP and get the code and you know tell them you know i'm a customer you got to give me what i want i'll take the code and i'll change the code so that i can do low level code and keep the p gate from forcing zero volts on current pins but they laid me off so i never got around to it and then they came back and asked me hey this doesn't work what do you know you did p gate off and what do you know everything goes to shit so they probably had to go back to the other method. So they're using, having go out and buy high power VIs to do this. But uh, notice this is much lower power 
and it just gets better if it gets more power, more current. You're just adding more VIs in parallel. So this is really, really cool. You can avoid this whole thing with this high power VI on the input pin. The input pin can be very low power VI. Um, you're not going to need much. Now last video I talked about making a sine wave, but I was showing you how I could uh, generate sine waves, and here is how I generate a sine wave in my sigma delta converter. Um, I generate a five cycle sine wave. There you go. For i equals zero through i is less than samples, i plus plus, i being an integer, my wave real element i is equal to float sine of 2 times pi times i times 5 divided by the number of samples. That's how you generate a sine wave. No big deal. For 7 cycles of the wave, you simply use a 7 instead of a 5. If you want 100 cycles of the wave, you just use a 100. Whatever you want. It's pretty, pretty easy. I mean, I don't see why people have trouble with this. Why anybody would have trouble generating a sine wave, I do not know. As I said, I used to make sine waves on my calculator, which I always used to carry in my pocket. So I had a graphing calculator, so I could make a sine wave any old time. I couldn't do an effigy, but I could make sine waves. It was pretty cool. So it's kind of fun. Um, electronics is not hard. I got a comment on my op amp video. Oh, it's like he's teaching himself. Well. You know, I'm trying to teach you, and I really hope it helps you. Um, I did have, when I was working at Bay Valley Tech, before I went into TCC, I was given a customer who signed up for training, and he was trying to get through op amps, and he just couldn't pass the op amp test. So they gave him to me for, I think, two weeks, maybe three weeks. So they said, okay, Dan, you are responsible for teaching this guy op amps. So I did my absolute best, and he could never, ever figure it out. So um, they had to give him his money back. Okay, and I, I just couldn't, I couldn't make him understand op amps. And then I went to TTC, where they taught op amps the way my op amp video works. And oh my God, you know, if I had taught him that way, he might have got it. But remember what I said about IQ. Not everybody's smart enough to figure this stuff out, you know. I mean, even if you've got a decent IQ, your brain may not be fine-tuned for that. Um, it's really messed up. So let's hope that you've got a brain that will help you get through it. Uh, hopefully you don't have instructors that do stuff like this, you know. I saw this, this thing on harmonics. Look at this. What does a dog have to do with harmonics? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Hopefully your instructors are not that bad, but uh, I'm doing what I can to help you out. Okay, so once again from the river, this is Dan Bullard. See ya.